So good evening. Uh, thanks for remaining. That's uh, that's great. That's a good achievement for me. Uh, so uh, tonight I would like to to share my experience because uh, there isn't, let's say, like in, in microservices, a lot of uh, literature, literature, and uh, a lot of information how to deal with uh, uh, micro frontends. Uh, and therefore, what I'm trying to do is, I mean, this mission to share as much as po uh, as possible what we are doing, why we take uh, we took certain path in our company, and and so on and so forth. Okay, so who am I? Uh, my name is Luca. I'm a VP of architecture at The Zone. Um, I'm a Google developer expert and I'm um, running the London JavaScript community. So let's start from the beginning. Okay, I think uh, many of you, or at least this is my experience, um, started with uh, um, um, in a startup or a new project, Greenfield project. Uh, to work on uh, uh, something with a hard deadline or you need to deliver as fast as you, as you can. So in our case, uh, we had like uh, uh, roughly at the beginning seven people to aggregate seven, six different companies uh, that were uh, and developing not only the back-end layer but also the uh, front-end layer um, that was uh, a single page application. A big classic, and it has to work. There is a, a nice requirement that has to work not only on web and mobile, but also on around 14 different TV devices. So, set of boxes, console, web, mobile, all, all, of, all of them. Um, and that is for me where, where usually developers shine because uh, there are a lot of constraints and we're not used anymore because we have these amazing quad core the, mm, computers that are rendering everything. Uh, instead, on, on TVs, is pretty funny. So, on, on the back end, what we, we have done um, is uh, uh, creating uh, obviously a Monolith, uh, we decided to have just MongoDB uh, for the backend. Um, and uh, we were like roughly internally, um, not many people. We work with uh, some uh, third parties. It was uh, an interesting uh, uh, journey. And then uh, we launched the, 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 the service that I will tell you in a moment what it is. Um, and suddenly we started to see that to have success. And <laughs> It was like a very nice feeling. The problem was that it was a month after the release, so we didn't expect that much success. Uh, and obviously, a lot of us uh, were thinking, okay, so uh, now what do we do? Because we started to, to see uh, some challenges, uh, how to scale the part. We started to use, we, we use AWS, for we are an AWS shop, so we are using heavily that part. Um, and it was pretty nice. So uh, I convinced the, the business to do an investment and work with microservices. Because obviously uh, there is a way that we can scale the company. Uh, there is a way that we can uh, identify the bounded context around our, our domain. We can start to work with domain driven design. We start to uh, identify what are, um, let's say, the best practices. Definitely there is some overhead. But overall, if you want to scale a business, uh, that a solution that was valid. The reality, though, is what do you do on the front end? And that was a question that I had in my uh, career several times because at that stage, you know, it was uh, pretty obvious that at some point we were scaling, but scaling like blitz scaling. Uh, and it's, it's not an easy thing because on front end, usually you don't speak much about architecture. Usually you steal the uh, wisdom from, uh, from the past. So you look at, I don't know, MVI, DCI, uh, you look from uh, different type of architectures, but in reality, no one is talking about scale because now it's becoming more complex that ecosystem. So can we do something? That was my question at the beginning. So um, I think w w we can. Um, it's not uh, perfect, but uh, it's, it's a trade-off. Um, Neil Ford usually says that uh, there isn't the perfect architecture, there are only the less worse one. And I fully agree with this, because in reality it's always a trade-off. It's based on the context where you operate, it's based on uh, the, the skills of your people, it's based on several things that are outside the technical part. Uh, and often we don't take into consideration that part, but as uh, architects, as lead developer tech leads, this is very important, because if you ignore the um, company structure, you don't try to change that, it could bite uh, yourself in, uh, in, in uh, a few months. And that, that was a huge problem. So what we came uh, about was this architecture that was the beginning, and then we moved to this. So what we started to do is, okay, so let's think about um, uh, what are the principles of microservices. So we would like to have independent releases. We would like to have 
decisions that are made uh, domain by domain, business domain by business domain. I don't want to have any more attack lead that is imposing the decision from since the beginning of the project and uh, for the next foreseeable future maintaining the same the same thing. That is something that honestly, uh, when I was a developer and a tech lead, I didn't like much. Um, but um, I do understand why it was like that. And the investment for the company wasn't always there because obviously, if you ask to the company, I need to rewrite uh, an application that is I don't know ten years old. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of development, and you, you cannot really do that. But with that, potentially we can do that. Potentially we can start to uh, do what uh, we are used to do on, on the microservices, so applying strangle pattern on, on the old application. And that's more or less what we have done, and that will uh, guide you to, to the journey. Uh, one piece that is very important for me is uh, uh, the routing part. So one thing that we need uh, to nail uh, almost up front is how do you route between micro frontends? And there are several ways. I will uh, I will show you what we are doing on our side. But as I wrote here, you can you can do that on the edge. You can do on server side. You can do client side. There are uh, plenty of uh, uh, possibilities. So let's try to define what is a micro frontend because there aren't many information out there. So for me, micro frontend is the representation of a business subdomain. And that is very important. So we start from, from domain-driven design. Uh, they allow independent implementation with same or different technology. Finally, they should avoid should avoid sharing logic. I know that is very controversial, controversial because we learn something different, abstraction and other things. But it's not always the case. And finally, are uh, owned by a single team. So those, for me, are the key characteristics that um, uh, are important for, uh, um, for microfrontends. Because having those characteristics uh, allows you uh, to work independently, to take local decision over global decision. And obviously, yes, there are, let's say, some coordination between teams. There are community of practices. There are uh, several things that uh, are happening um, outside your team. But the reality is no one better than you that you're working on that domain can take a decision than anyone else. Because in reality, certain decision, you shouldn't get just a one decision that um, uh, fits them all. You need to find the right decision for your business domain. And that's why uh, we work with that. The other thing is scaling on front end is not a technical problem. It's a social problem. Because the reality, think about that. If you produce vast majority of the time some static files, you have the CDN that is uh, absorbing the, the heat. But the reality is, when you are scaling, the uh, person, the people factor, human being factor, is very, very important, way more important than infrastructure. For us, for instance, our infrastructure um, for front-end is pretty basic. So we have like a cloud front distribution, we have an S3 bucket, and we store everything there, and we have a lambda at the edge in front, and we will see later on why. But the reality is, is the how I can have in our case, a lot of dev centers and work with all those people um, and uh, accordingly and not blocking each of them because the communication overhead is always a pain. If you remember, if you're a developer, um, I remember when I was a developer, having external dependencies, it was super frustrating. And uh, I, I, I struggled to, to finish my sprint every time because you really need to nail uh, the part, you need to wait for another team and maybe obviously for that team is not a priority that what, what you're asking for and so on and so forth. So, um, we would like to have like a speed of delivery, we would like to have an, implement, uh, an independent implementation uh, and, and that we, want, we would try to avoid sharing logic. That is something that I will come back later. So there are several, okay, there are several companies that are embracing um, microfrontends. It's not just us. And there are way more than that. New Relic is another one and we will talk about observability, so uh, it's good to mention that. Each of them have their own way to implement that. Now, um, in, in this talk, uh, I would like to cover what we have done, because obviously uh, it's the part that can go deeper and share the challenges and, and everything. Uh, but um, I'm, I'm writing a lot around uh, the different um, uh, microfrontends architecture, so uh, feel free to check on, on my uh, Twitter account, uh, my, my updates. So here what we have is, uh, I, I will skip for a moment the zone, uh, but uh, let's, let's think about uh, the, uh, the open table. Open table is a, a very interesting use case. Um, here in uh, uh, London there was the DX team, um, that created what they call open component, that is a framework uh, that allows you to compose on the fly um, your microfrontends uh, at the server level and serve and basically uh, uh, serve them uh, like a normal page uh, at the CDN level. So you basically hit the CDN, they absorb all the, the, the traffic, and what they do is they have a registry, like a Docker registry or NPM, with all the micro frontends, and everyone can, from any uh, different location, they have, if I remember well, three dev centers, one in Australia, one in San Francisco, and one in London. 
but I could be wrong. Um, and uh, they are, they, if there is a component that uh, is interesting for you, or if there is a part of, of the application that could be also more complex than just a component. It could be like, um, I don't know, uh, something that is present in the page that is prominent inside the page. You can you can take that from, from the library and then merge everything and then you, you can uh, uh, ship it. And it's pretty pretty powerful. They created, they made a lot of investment around uh, the developer experience, CLI and uh, um, uh, the, uh, let's say, the developer experience in general, the, the, the CI, the CD and so on. Um, and that was uh, one thing, and as far as I know, because we have a sky scanner here, I know that it is also embraced by sky scanner. Yes, it's confirmed. Um, so, <laughs> well, not with a nice face, but it's nice. Um, interface, interface framework is another one that Zalando, Zalando was one of the first that I saw, not talking about micro frontends, but I'm um, embracing the, the logic. At the beginning, they had uh, what they call. Um, uh, it's called Taylor.js, and basically they do also for them these, um, let's say, uh, fact that they assemble the micro frontends on the server side, and then that they are serving them. Obviously, they have uh, um, a different challenge because they have personalization and other things that they cannot be cached. But um, um, recently, they move away from that pattern because they were uh, assembling uh, HTML fragments, uh, and now they they decided to go uh, less pu purist, and they decide to go with React, and they create a library of React component, uh, GraphQL and uh, uh, basically there is an API that is describing how to compose the, the, the page and they serve through the CDN. Again, an another, another uh, way to manage that. Then there is uh, edge side include that is running on, on the edge, so CDN. Uh, and uh, the interesting part there is a, a language that is, uh, was, a, let's say, they tried to be a standard uh, with W3C and um, and it was uh, uh, proposed by Akamai. So currently, the main issue that you have with the uh, edge-side includes is the fact that uh, not all the CDNs are, are using that. Uh, and therefore, uh, if, you, if you try to have a multi-CDN multi strategy or you want to migrate from one CDN to another one, you need to pay attention that you, don't, uh, that you have all the functionality you're looking for. So it's another interesting one. Finally, Spotify. Um, Spotify had, uh, is using iframes. Uh, I know that probably m many of you are laughing. But for the desktop application. Uh, so they move away from that implementation on the web because it was uh, definitely not optimized at all. But if you check inside your desktop application, uh, I like to decompose things. Uh, so you can see that they created some SPA files that are basically zip file uh, renamed as SPA. And inside there you have like HTML page with uh, um, JavaScript and bundle and CSS. That's it. Very simple. But it works. And it's also used by SAP. Uh, they release a framework called Luigi framework that does uh, basically they compose that thing. But if you think about that before you laugh again, uh, for SAP it makes a lot of sense because they are in control of which browser the user can use because it's a B2B platform. So they can really say, listen, you know what? This one is going to work X, Y, Z. So as you can see, there are, there are several uh, things. So let's see the, what we have done. So first of all, how many of you knows the Zoom? Okay, a few of them. So currently imagine this platform that is an OTT platform, similar to Netflix, but for sports, and we do mainly live sports um, with um, in nine, in currently in nine countries on roughly 30 different devices uh, nowadays. And, and it's interesting because obviously you have all the problems of scalability, you have all the problems of um, oh, the, the Champions League final is starting, so a million of users is, is joining the, the, the platform. Happy days. Um, but the reality is also uh, in very interesting from the human part. So how do you scale 300 engineers uh, uh, all over, the, uh, all over the, the, the Europe? So at the beginning, I remember I was the second person that was uh, that joined the zone um, in the tech side uh, because the, at the beginning they were using uh, third-party companies, um, and they, they there was uh, the, the the CTO was talking with me and said, listen. Every time that you design something, please take in consideration also the human part. It's not just the technology part, because definitely it's important. But we are going to have hundreds of people. Now, you can imagine how much I was laughing when uh, I was the second one and I was looking to the guy close to me that was the, the, the first. So it was pretty interesting. Um, so what we have done, um, we started to have, uh, let's say, quite a few teams. So fast forward a few years from uh, uh, 2016. Now we are from 50 that we started, we are roughly 3,000 um, and all over the world, not only on tech, obviously. But that is uh, how we, we uh, let's say, divide the, our, our strategy. 
And as you can see, there are tons of themes, and here there are missing some. Obviously, I try to get, let's say, the most uh, prominent one, but um, sometimes are cross-functional themes, sometimes are not, because the problem is, if you have a cross-functional team and uh, uh, you are designing API with one platform, all the other platforms start to complain. So you need to, to abstract that part and say, okay, so um, politic-wise, we need to define an API that is, uh, so we have a team that is just doing backend and, team that, and multiple teams that do front-end and consuming that API. Uh, it depends from the complexity of the domain, but there are some things uh, like, for instance, the sports data team that is doing end-to-end -end everything. So when you see something on, on top of, of the video player, that is the sports data team that create a component on the UI uh, that uh, is ingesting some real-time data and is uh, shoving inside the uh, scrub bar of the video player or other parts of, of the video. So it's, it's, it's very, and uh, I think that is also one of our strengths. We didn't, at the beginning, we were very fragmented. We didn't think, okay, so now we have like a bit of, um, I don't know, authentication and authorization in London and a bit in, in Amsterdam, and then we have uh, a bit of TVs in, in uh, uh, London and another bit we have in um, um, uh, Katowice in Poland. It was painful at the beginning, and when I, I thought, okay, now we are going to scale, but we're going to scale hard, so we ramp up like a dev center in Amsterdam from zero to 140 people in 10 months, um, it could be a problem, because, again, it's a social problem, it's more <laughs> than a technical problem. So, what I, I, I did at the time, I stopped everyone, uh, including the CTO, and I said, listen, I think here we are doing something wrong because we are designing our architecture based on our teams where they are located. But in reality, what we should do is the other thing. So the, the other way around, because if you know the Conway's law, that is basically uh, stating that uh, you design your architecture based on, on the company structure, you have the inverse Con Conway's maneuver that is doing the opposite. So you create the architecture and you structure your team based on the, um, on the architecture. And this is exactly what we have done. Uh, and so far is, uh, uh, is uh, a pretty good success. I will show you later on uh, a few other hints on the, on the around that. Okay, so what we have done, as you have seen in, uh, in uh, the previous um, uh, slide, we have created something that is called the bootstrap. That is not the framework, CSS framework, not, nothing to do with that, okay, so <laughs> uh, absolutely nothing. It was just because it's the first thing that you load. Um, and uh, we, what we identify, looking at data, Looking, talking with our domain expert and trying to understand how to split this monolith was understanding the user journey, understanding how the user were consuming our platform. And then suddenly we discovered that we have like quite a lot of people that were going to landing pages and then there was a drop of people who were going to authentication, they arrived to the payment, they didn't like the payment methods that were there and then they never finalized the, the, the sign up. The other thing that we notice is when a user is signed up, they will never log out they always remain there. So all the code related on the authentication, the SDK for credit card, all the other things um, are not useful. You, we don't load at the moment, but uh, at, the, at, at the time, but it wasn't useful at all. So we know that we, uh, we had to figure out something. So what we did is, okay, so we can slice our application vertically. So we can start to say, okay, we have like a, a landing page proxy that is loading landing page because we have, roughly hundreds of landing pages that are depending from uh, country, depends from the device, depends from um, the campaign and so on. Uh, so we need something that is orchestrating a bit. Um, then we need uh, an authentication bit that contains sign in, sign up, uh, that contains re retrieve email, retrieve password. Um, then we have another part that is the, key, the core part for the zone, that is the discovery part. So I want a catalog, I want to, the best video player for live possible. Uh, I want to watch uh, my content at any time, I want to watch in any device. Then we have the customer support part, and finally we have my account. Those are the things that we, we saw, we bucketized, let's say, our user journey, and we found those as uh, prominent uh, um, microphone tents. So we, we decided to go with this. So we decided to take our application, split it, but there was a missing thing. How do we move from landing pages to authentication? That was the, the, the big question. Okay, so we came up with this idea of Bootstrap. Um, that basically what it does is uh, an app shell. Okay, so it's like a container that is the first thing that you load and it will always be there for you the moment that you type the zone.com or you go to a TV application. It's always there. We will see later on what it does, but at the moment, the key thing is that the bootstrap is orchestrating uh, these microphone tents and is the one that is loading or unloading uh, the uh, landing page and move to authentication or vice versa. So we, we created some rules. So the first thing is each microphone tent has to represent a subdomain. 
matching the business structure. So currently, what we, we, we have done is uh, we already have the product team that was almost, uh, let's say, divided in the way that we, we divided the, the, the application, but we force certain things. And uh, currently it's working very well because they have their dedicated team, depends from the device, but they all speak the same ubiquitous language. That was the goal. Then we wanted to have technology framework agnostic microfrontends. And I know that a lot of people are saying, okay, but do you share some, some libraries? Do you, let's say, share components, stuff like that? Okay, so at the beginning, we were very, very purist. No, we didn't share anything. Uh, so uh, you have like, uh, because of what we have seen, so for landing page, we just have um, and, uh, React with um, uh, a static HTML, because we compile that, um, at, sorry, we render at compile time and we serve a static page. Uh, for um, uh, authentication, we have a single page application that was made with React. But the reality is when you are in, you are in, as we, we saw before. So therefore, when you load the, the main thing, the core domain of the zone, you just load once, and that's it. Also on TV, the performances uh, are, are improving. So we move from a certain device from a startup of the application of 40 seconds to, in very old devices, to less than 20. So those kind of things, those kinds of, of, of logic were not only dedicated for web, but also, because for us it's very important, TVs. And we want to provide the possibility to pick your technology. So there was an, an interesting use case. Landing page guys, uh, they saw the React hooks and they wanted to try. They try in production, didn't say anyone uh, to anyone this thing was working. No problem at all. It was pretty simple, pretty quick. In one sprint, they uh, replaced what they wanted to, to test. They put in production, was working, hit by millions of users done. And then they shared their, their uh, um, let's say, um, information. They shared what they have learned from that. That was a pretty interesting <coughs> use case. Then the other thing is, I want to have a microphone that is autonomous. I don't want to deploy the, the uh, authentication microphone 10 coordinating that with the discovery. I want that I can deploy just one of that, because that's the whole point. If I can do that, and I need to make some, some uh, let's say, strong decisions, um, therefore no code duplicate, uh, sorry, no um, abstractions as, po as much as possible, uh, I, can, I can do that. Then uh, inside the microphone 10, the team can share components, code styles, and, and so on. That is uh, another thing that we, we, we assess. We create an independent building system. Now, I know that uh, a lot of people uh, would think, okay, but why you don't provide that? We provide the basics, so we have like drone that is running, but what is inside a, a container that is running on drone is up to the team to decide, because they can have optimization that other teams shouldn't, uh, shouldn't have, or they want to translate certain things that they don't have. So they have like several uh, plugins for uh, um, rollup and for, uh, for uh, uh, Webpack, and they can use them, share between teams, it's not a problem at all, but that's, that's how it works. The other important thing for me is when you have the booster uploaded, you always load one microphone time per time. You will never compose anything on the client side. You always load a single page application or a single page because in that case, it means that you're using the, the let's say, the holy trinity of JavaScript. So you use HTML, you use CSS, you use JavaScript, and you don't have to compose anything. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. If, you, if there is a new tool that uh, um, you want to use, you will be able to. And you can also split. We, we happen at some point, it happens at some time that the complexity of a domain became uh, too big on the back end and the front end, so we started to split the domain in, in two micro front ends. And now it's, it's working like a charm. So as I said, a micro front end for us is the holy trinity of, of front end. An index HTML, a JavaScript uh, file for the application, a vendor JavaScript that has a, a high uh, TTL uh, on, on CDN, and the style CSS or wherever the, the, the team decide to have. That is how we work. So when you type the zoom.com, uh, what happens is that you load the bootstrap uh, immediately and is the, the, the part that is doing the logic. And what it's responsible for is doing an application startup that is basically a set of calls to understand if you are authenticated, not authenticated, authenticated in which country you are, and other settings like, like uh, feature toggles and so on. It's abstracting input output operation, uh, therefore uh, web storage. And I know that um, you say, but it's a pretty standard. Yes, unfortunately not on all the TVs. So instead of having microphone tents that knows about um, each single TV that they are running, I can have agnostic microphone tents that are running in any device, um, potentially, uh, depends from the performances, obviously, um, and, uh, and Bootstrap is taking care about the abstraction layer. So you just expose some API to say, uh, save, save or get, something like that. It's routing between microphone tents that we saw before. And uh, it's sharing configuration across multiple microphone tents. So imagine that uh, I'm uh, not authenticated. I go to the authentication microphone tent, 
I perform, um, let's say, <coughs> the uh, sign-in and I receive a token and then I pass that to the bootstrap, the booster store on the local storage and the next microphone time that is loaded uh, will, can, will, will retrieve that, uh, the JWT token from the, from the bootstrap and validate if it's still valid. If it's still valid, it will go ahead and show. Otherwise, it will kick out the user to uh, another page. Now, what is the bootstrap in reality? It's just a JavaScript file, vanilla JavaScript, nothing crazy and very light. It's loaded at the beginning, it's always there, and uh, uh, expose a set of APIs that are used for the microphone tents for several things. It could be lifecycle, it could be, um, let's say, um, communication for um, I.O. operation. So imagine that, for instance, um, one question I usually have at this stage is, okay, but how do you load the, the microphone tent? And um, so we, we thought, uh, what is the most basic way to load the, uh, some HTML? You can use the URL, yeah, but we, we, need, we should need to replicate all the logic of each single uh, microphone end. Or HTML in reality is XML, so we can parse it. So let's parse it. So we basically tag uh, in the HTML the, ta the tags that uh, we are interested, and uh, the bootstrap is uh, loading. Um, and what it does is appending inside itself the different elements. That's what it does. The interesting bit of this is there are several frameworks out there that are a starting, as, as a starting point of a microphone and this is just JavaScript. But there is a strong reason why we picked this, because we care to provide an immediate feedback to the user. So what we can do here, and certain microphone dance are doing, are compiling um, at runtime a skeleton that is served immediately. The moment that we download the HTML, the user has immediate feedback, and then they, we start to load in background all the JavaScript, all the other stuff. And that is working on TV as well as web. So, um, come on, okay. So as I said, the bootstrap exposes some uh, methods, uh, the lifecycle methods. So it's notifying the microphone 10 when it's uh, finished to load and when it's uh, finished to, uh, when it's, um, it's about to do unload. Uh, and we can use that for uh, cleaning out uh, uh, the, the uh, pointers. So in that case, the interesting bit we did there is we take uh, the keys of, in the bootstrap, we take the keys of what we have at the beginning of the application because we loaded just the bootstrap. And every time that there is a microphone that is appending inside the bootstrap, we re retrieve, we scan all the, 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 the DOM nodes and JavaScript inside the window and we take like just the keys inside uh, uh, the memory. And then when we unload the microphone end, we just remove all the things. So it's always clean. Obviously, there is, for a moment, between in transition between microphone tents, there is a, a moment where there is a bit of, um, let's say, uh, memory uh, overlap, but usually it doesn't hurt, and not it doesn't hurt even on TV, that usually you have like strong constraint on memory. And then you have local storage and, and other stuff. Okay, so apart from microphone tents, we have also the distinction of components. So I said the microphone tents is a business representation, but we use components. We have some area of the application that are really complex, video player for us. Having, uh, and if you're familiar with the video players, usually all the open source that you find or commercial uh, licenses are mainly focused on VOD. But we are a, a live company and uh, the heuristics of the video player for live is completely different. So we had to spin up a team dedicated to that in order to build our own video player uh, for uh, all the, uh, the, the devices. And trust me, it wasn't easy at all. Because also, um, many that we are using, for instance, one that I uh, remember is Shaka Player. Shaka Player is uh, maintained by Google as open source uh, um, uh, video player. And we changed the heuristic of that, or that because it wasn't good enough. So those are the challenges that we have. So that team, what it does is exporting a component, like you have like a com um, components library, and is embedded inside the microphone tents like you always work. You don't have to compose anything at runtime. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You just have a library on NPM, and uh, uh, you just use it. Simple like that. Obviously, you need to define the contract first. So we always, have, if we have some parts that are shared, we, we gather with the teams and the architects, and we try to figure out what are the APIs that we need in order to manage the model there. But when we define that, they can work in parallel, and it's not a problem. The other interesting bit uh, that I decided to add is uh, the canary release thing. So the, co the company asked me, can we have a way to, in general, not wait for building all the microphone tents and deploy them? And there, at the beginning, I was a bit puzzled because I said, yes, yeah, microservices is no problem, but on front end, what do we have? 
So because our architecture was very simple, cloud front and um, S3, uh, I thought, okay, let's try Lambda the Edge. Lambda the Edge, uh, if you're not familiar, um, it can be triggered in, in four stages when there is a viewer request, origin request, origin response, and viewer response. Uh, and what it does is you can add logic on the edge. So you don't hit, um, you, let's say, you hit the closest um, uh, AWS dev center, uh, sorry, the data center, uh, where uh, the, um, the request is coming from. And in that case, you can orchestrate certain things. So what we have done, basically, is uh, um, deciding in, so we started to say, okay, we want to deploy in a specific country on a specific browser or device, and we want to deploy that, and every time there is another request, boom, it goes to 1.0. So that allows us to, to do many um, and incremental deployment per day than before it was a nightmare, in particular for TV. So the other nice thing is we can, we decided to go a very deep granularity, so country and browser, because this, the, the, it depends from the browser what kind of video player you need to use. And that was uh, uh, pretty interesting because uh, I, I have like, um, if you search on YouTube, there is a, a talk that I did at uh, Reinvent about this uh, with the AWS. Uh, it was uh, uh, an interesting topic. We also managed to do uh, SEO through that. So we can redirect the uh, crawler to a specific pages that are dedicated only for crawlers. And surprise, surprise, we discovered that also Amazon is doing that uh, with Amplify. They are doing, when you deploy something on Amplify, they are switching the, the things together. It's, it was a pretty, uh, pretty nice understanding that we were on the right track. Okay, so as I said, the design structure on the DDD part is something like that. So we try to take all, our, all the things that you have seen so far and, and map our teams in this way. So we define Following um, uh, the, the, the core domain, the generic domain, and the core and supporting domain. And we mapped our teams in that way, our company in this way. And that, then what we have done is saying, okay, perfect, where is the core team? Where is based? But London, we have like uh, uh, all the, the POs and all the, uh, the marketing people, so probably we need to, to iterate fast on this because this is our core business. Uh, generic is Amsterdam, so we have all the payments guys that are managing my account, help onboarding front and back end, uh, all the partnership and everything. And basically, uh, the um, person that is um, s far from you is like a couple of uh, couple of uh, steps. So it's pretty good because then there, there is cross contamination between my, between um, Dev Center, but it was pretty good. Core supporting in Katowice because we have a lot of TVs and uh, we found, uh, let's say, a pretty nice uh, place there. And also for mobile native teams. We have also some backend stuff, but we are moving uh, to London. Now we have a global team. That is uh, my team, the X, uh, so developer experience, cloud engineering, uh, cloud engineers, and SREs. And all together, basically, we are supporting those teams. Okay, so what we achieved. So first of all, uh, when we were scaling up, one day I arrived to the office and I have uh, <laughs> like five new teams uh, that, uh, that joined uh, in, in London and in basically they were working on, on the same project in, in three weeks. The, the nice thing was they were capable after, uh, because they have the freedom to take certain decision and use the technology they want, they were able to, um, let's say, do in the first print already uh, provide some, some value for the company and deliver something because the, all the automation was sorted out and they started to have the first part on, on the UI. Now we have uh, over 300 techies, 350 techies, uh, that are working on the same platform. There are obviously some, some parts that are back-end, some parts that are front-end, but, um, and some parts are back-office, some parts are the uh, layer that is hit by, by the users, uh, and so on and so forth. But it's, it's really difficult arriving to that in one year and a half. And having those guys that are creating value for the company, not for, um, also for the scalability issues uh, and the challenges that we have, but also because uh, those people uh, it's the first time that uh, they, they work together and for instance in Amsterdam we have 24 different countries there so there is a huge diversity and it's, it's not easy at all. But we were uh, able to make the work. The other interesting thing, we de-risk our releases. So um, it's like two years that we don't have an S1 incident. Uh, we do multiple releases per day. Remember at the beginning we did uh, in the first week 26 the um, release of, of the video player. Uh, and we were literally switching, turning on, turning off uh, the different part of so which browser and which country where we wanted to test it. And we were testing in real time in production, then go back uh, if it didn't work. 
Um, and then we doubling our user base every year. So at the beginning, you know, when uh, you have like few users is one thing. When you start to have millions and millions, it's starting to become more complex. That's it for me. I know that you, maybe you have several questions, so I left some time for that. <laughs>